Good morning, and welcome to Ephesian Vision Ministries, a service we call The Way. And it is uh, fall here in Central Oregon. The leaves on the trees are turning all kinds of beautiful colors. Um, we have a, um, uh, a highway that goes through the mountains called Highway 242, McKenzie Pass. And if you ever get a chance to come to Central Oregon, haven't been up there yet this year, but it is just absolutely beautiful. All different brilliant colors of fall, oranges and yellows and reds and browns and all different shades therein. And even when you drive through uh, Bend, uh, which is a city that has a lot of trees, a lot of evergreens, but also a lot of the, uh, the annual trees that uh, turn colors. So if you're here, really check out the trees. Thank you for being with us, with us this morning, and let's open with prayer. Lord, we just pray for our country right now. God, I pray for your Holy Spirit to speak and for us, the church, to be able to listen to the Holy Spirit, God. We need the presence of the Spirit <clears throat> in our daily lives, in our church, and in our nation, in our world right now. God, you said, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, I will hear from heaven and I will heal their land. God, our land is in so much of a need of healing today. There's so many challenges out there. Fear is rampant. But God, you came, you sent your son so that we would not live in a spirit of fear. God, may we rest and trust in you. Speak through me this morning. God, let these be words from the Holy Spirit and not words from a man. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. 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 Well, Beverly, <laughs> glad to have you with us this morning. If you're online with the Internet, uh, thank you for being with us. If you missed the service and want to watch it again, you can catch it on YouTube or just go to our website, tjn1.tv. tjn one .tv. TV. have a couple of announcements this morning. There is a church here in Bend, Christian Life Center, and they're going to have a family fun circus on Halloween, 31st at 6 p.m. And at the very beginning of it, they're going to have, have a uh, they're going to have games and candy and all kinds of fun for the family, kind of a harvest festival instead of Halloween. And during the very first part of it, I was out there yesterday talking to some folks, and they're going to have a place for uh, special needs kids. That then come and also enjoy the holiday, enjoy um, the harvest festival. So that's Halloween, which is Monday this year, um, starting at 6 p.m. That's on Highway 20, the Christian Life Center here in Bend. So praise God for that. Also, something happened with the uh, Fellowship of Christian Athletes uh, this last week, Wednesday night. They had 150 people show up for their first Field of Faith. That's where they reach out to young people and athletes and uh, share the love of Jesus Christ with them. They had a time of, of worship, and it was uh, they turned the lights on in the field and just had a, a service right there. They had about six kids from different schools sharing testimonies of what Christ has done in their lives, and they had uh, a goal or a challenge for the kids for the next 21 days to read through a chapter of the Gospel of the Book of John each day. Uh, every time I... I I uh, talk about the book of John. I remember a good friend, Bill Hewitt, who we're going to remember this morning in prayer. Bill isn't feeling too well this morning, so Bill, uh, I know you're not walking, watching because you don't have a computer at home, but we will hold you up in prayer. The, um, the response at the first field of faith in Central Oregon, five kids accepted Jesus Christ into their lives Wednesday night. Five kids. That's amazing. And... Uh, our congratulations to the Central Oregon FCA board, Dennis Legg, and all the others uh, for what they're doing with Fellowship of Christian Athletes. So, a couple of announcements there this morning. One of the things that we're going to be talking about is unity in the body of Christ. Uh, this is Ephesians Vision Ministry. The book of Ephesians talks about unity in the body of Christ. Corinthians also talks about unity in the body of Christ. And as I was per per prayerfully preparing, <laughs> it was a long night, sorry, prayerfully preparing for this morning's sermon, um, God really put on my heart the church in Corinth. And the church in Corinth has so many similarities with what's going on today. Uh, Paul, when he visited the church, was concerned about the fact that they were dividing into so many groups. There's a narrative in this Bible 
that explains it so well, and I think I want to take a minute to read it. Corinth was a place of wealth, a place of prosperity, a place of money, and also a place where, uh, for example, the city was renowned for uh, temple prostitutes. Aphrodite, you've heard that name before, she was in Corinth. And so the city, um, in fact, also I was reading up on the internet yesterday, and Corinth was the city in which the first ship was built that was uh, involved in the first naval battle. So Corinth was a, a city of influence and a city of wealth and a, a city of pleasure. Paul was especially concerned about the way the Corinthian Christians were always arguing and dividing themselves into groups and about the way they treated one another. Those are two of Paul's main concerns as he wrote 1 Corinthians. Love, Paul tells us, is even more important than faith or hope. Above all, love one another. All of the problems in the church could be solved if all the members would love one another as Christians should. And we know that in the Bible, love is kind and patient, never jealous, boastful, proud, or rude. Love rejoices in the truth, but not in evil. Love is always supportive, loyal, hopeful, and trusting. And love never fails. The greatest power in the universe is the love of Christ. It was the love of God that sent Jesus Christ to the cross and redeemed us from our sins. We didn't deserve it, but God did it anyway. So, such is the shape of the church in Corinth. And so many similarities between Corinth and the United States. Um, a country of influence, a country of wealth. So many people think they don't need God because mm, I'm very, very well off. Thank you very much. I don't need your God. Um, a city where uh, pleasures, lust reigns, um, and all you have to do is turn on the TV, pick up a magazine, almost practically any kind of magazine today, uh, even magazines that initially were, were for kids, have some kind of... of um, sensual message to it. And, and uh, one of the things that disturbs me greatly is even um, you read stories about little kids, little girls being turned into beauty queens when they're only, you know, preteens. And that's just not right. We need to get let kids be kids. And I think somebody needs to hear that message today. If you have a little girl, you need to, she needs to spend time playing with Barbies and just being a little girl and not have to grow up and be a six-year-old beauty queen. So uh, that's just something that I've been seeing that really, really kind of bothers me. So a couple of things that I want to talk about this morning is our, our um, comparison to the church in Corinth and what Paul's concerns are about the infighting and dividing into groups, like I, like I said just a moment ago. There's so much of that that goes on in the body of Christ today. Uh, the denominations, and we here in America, and I think worldwide, we like to have be on teams. There's, there's something in our human psyche that likes to belong to groups. We like to be accepted. Excuse me. We like to be loved. And we're, uh, especially Americans are very patriotic, very loyal. We like to have our teams. I'm a, da I'm a Dallas Cowboys fan. I'm also a, a Den uh, not a Denver, but a Boise State Broncos fan. I know uh, that may not be totally acceptable here in Central Oregon. You either have to be an Oregon Duck, University of Oregon Duck, or an Oregon State Beaver. I guess if I have to choose, my daughter's going to Oregon State, so I have to be an Oregon State Beaver. But at heart, I, I as they say, bleed blue. I'm, uh, I'm from Southwest Idaho, and so Boise State is, is my team and the Dallas Cowboys. But um, we shouldn't transfer the, that team loyalty into the church. One of the things that I've been praying about and really concerned about when I'm looking at the body of Christ is uh, the body of Christ is not like the NFL. And the NFL National Football League has different teams and everybody picks a team. That's not that's not what God had in mind when the body of Christ. That's not what Paul had in mind when he was speaking to the church in Corinth, very concerned about how they were loving each other and very, very concerned about how they were dividing into groups. I think if Paul were alive today, he'd be preaching uh, First and Second Corinthians 
just all over the place because of what he would be seeing in the body of Christ today. Because in church Christianity today, we are dividing ourselves up into denominations. And we are getting caught up in, in some of the doctrines like tongues or baptism of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we just want, and you know, it's comfortable for people to be in groups. But we need to love one another. One of the, one of the goals of Ephesians Vision Ministries, in fact, why we called it Ephesians Vision Ministries, is to promote unity in the body of Christ. And, and we just see this team building going on, which I don't think is healthy for the body of Christ. We need to find ways to work together. Um, that's one of the reasons why we take our morning show on the road and go all over the state and look for ways to network and, and get the body of Christ to work together. So that is our ongoing prayer, and I ask that you uh, join us in that. One of the things we strongly believe in here at Ephesian Vision Ministries is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. As you, um, if you're a Christian and you believe in Jesus Christ, I lost my place here in the Bible, but you don't have the power to overcome sin, or there's some things in your life that just continually get in the way, just um, kind of rocks in your road that you continue to stumble on. Maybe it's greed, maybe it's fear, maybe it's worry, maybe it's, uh, for men, maybe it's um, uh, pornography, maybe it's lust, maybe it's, uh, it could be any of a number of different things. But Jesus, before he left the disciples, he said, stay in Jerusalem and wait, wait, don't leave. Kind of like Carl Malden in the old um, credit card commercial, um, what was it? It was, um, I can't remember what it was, but he'd say, don't leave home without it. American Express. You know, Carl Malden was a police detective in the 70s, and he'd say, American Express, don't leave home without it. Uh, it's, it's, I'd laughingly kind of compare that to the Holy Spirit. That's what Jesus Christ was saying. Don't leave Jerusalem without the Holy Spirit. Why was he so specific about that? Because that's what he needed to empower the disciples to do the works of the gospel. Remember when Jesus Christ was baptized and he came to the river, John the Baptist baptized Jesus that point his ministry started. His ministry did not start before then. Remember what happened as Jesus Christ came out of the water. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, descended upon Jesus like a dove, and the voice from heaven said, This is my Son. Listen to him. If Jesus Christ needed the Holy Spirit, then he is our model. We are to follow. We are to be Christ-like. If Jesus Christ, the Son of God, needed the Holy Spirit, we desperately need the Holy Spirit to empower us. There is some controversy in the body of Christ about speaking in tongues, about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, whether or not the Holy Spirit is active and working today. I challenge you, and if, if you believe somewhere in this Bible that said the Holy Spirit left the planet, then I challenge you to show me where that is. Because I believe we really need it today. If they needed it in the days when Jesus ascended into heaven, we really need it today with to empower us as believers to share the gospel. After the Holy Spirit was given to them, in the second chapter of Acts, the day of Pentecost, the, empower, the, the believers, the disciples were empowered and did tremendous works. Let's go to Acts chapter 19, verse 1. While Apollos was in Corinth, Paul traveled across the hill country to Ephesus where he met some of the Lord's followers. Now, Apollos was one of the leaders in the church today, and one of the controversies in the church is, who do you follow? Do you follow John the Baptist? Do you follow Apollos? Do you follow Jesus? And they went to Jesus. Jesus' disciples were very concerned about this. They said, Jesus, they're, they're, they're dividing into groups, and they're, they're following other people. And Jesus Christ said, if they, if they are not against us, they are for us. So leave them alone. In other words, let them be and don't divide into these little groups. And that was the first instance of where church division was going on. And it's what Jesus Christ had to say about it. Don't be concerned about it. Everyone should love one another and follow one God, one Savior, one King, one Lord, one Christ. It talks about that in the book of Ephesians. 
But here we are in the book of Acts. So Apollos was in Corinth. Paul traveled there. Paul asked of the Lord's followers, he asked them, when you put your faith in Jesus, were you given the Holy Spirit? The believers said, no, we have never even heard of this Holy Spirit. Sadly to say, that's kind of the case in the church today, is, is the Holy Spirit is, is um, we teach faith in Jesus Christ, but we don't really teach about the baptism or the need of the Holy Spirit. Here's what Paul had to say. Then why were you baptized, Paul asked. That's an interesting question. You received Jesus Christ, and that was a given here when, when Paul talked to the believers. When you put your faith in Jesus, were you also given the Holy Spirit? They said no. Then Paul said, then why were you baptized? They answered, because of what John taught. Paul replied, John baptized people so that they would turn to God, but he also told them that someone else was coming and they should put their faith in him. Jesus is the one that John was talking about. After the people heard Paul say this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit was given to them, and they spoke unknown languages and pro prophesied. There were about 12 men in this group. There is uh, one of the controversies in the body of Christ today is, is the second baptism is what some people refer to. You receive Jesus Christ, but then there are pe many people that say that you need to have the Holy Spirit baptism or have the Holy Spirit come upon you as happened here. Also happened in the second chapter of Acts in the day of Pentecost. And we get, a lot, we get hung up a lot depending on arguing about when the Holy Spirit enters a believer's life and empowers the believer to do works of the gospel. I am not going to argue about whether or not the, the Holy Spirit baptism happens when you receive Jesus Christ or whether you need a second infilling of the Holy Spirit. Personally, I prefer the latter, where the second baptism and the infilling of the Holy Spirit. But I've seen instances where people receive Jesus Christ and they are immediately filled with the Holy Spirit. I've seen instances here in the Bible where there was the second uh, anointing, the second baptism, and the Holy Spirit empowered the believers. And you could see by their works that they went out in power and thousands were added to the church as they were touched by the Lord with this second baptism. But I've also seen believers where it happened the first time. But what I would like, I would encourage you to do is look for the fruit of the Spirit, where you see the power of God evidenced in their lives. Uh, faith, love, gentleness, long-suffering, patience. Of against these things there is no law. The fruit, look for the fruit of the Spirit in people's lives. I also think that it's very important for us to continue to be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. When Jesus was at the well and the woman came to him and, and uh, Jesus was talking about the water from the well, Jesus told her, if you drink from this well, you will thirst again. But if you drink from me, out of you will pour rivers of living water. Jesus was talking about the water that flows from him is, is a water that will satisfy continually. It's interesting Jesus used the analogy of a river. A river is not a lake or a pond. A river is, is a body of water that is constantly flowing. I've heard, especially these days, where there's so many problems that people have to deal with, that a lot of Christians feel burned out and at the end of their rope and powerless and overwhelmed by the problems of the day, problems of the world, economy, jobs, finances, health, sickness. And some of them give up. But remember Jesus said, out of, out of me will pour rivers of living water. The river is continually flowing. The river has a source. Interesting here in... Um, Central Oregon, there's a place called the Metolius River, and there is an underground aquifer, and out of the rock, this river just pours out of a rock, 
there's a lot of volcanic activity, or there was in the past, a lot of the Cascade Mountain Range's old volcanoes that obviously are not currently erupting, but there's a volcanic range here, and so there's a lot of that geothermal activity here. But this, this water that comes out of this rock is, is pure and cold and nice and clean, and it just pours out of the rock. It just spouts out into a river. So the river literally comes out of the rock. That is a great analysis or imagery of Jesus Christ, where this river pours out of the rock. And the Metolius River is a beautiful river. It's so pristine and clear that there's a lot of trophy fish in that river. And you, you can't use hooks because they want to keep those fish in that river. Beautiful fly fishing river uh, is the Metolius. But the river flows out of the rock, and as it does, it is pure and clean and life-giving. I think there's a very beautiful analogy or comparison between the Metolius and that river and the river that's Jesus Christ. The river pouring out of that is pure and clean and life-giving. Jesus Christ said the same thing about him. The river that flows out of me will continually provide you what you need. If you drink out of this normal well, you'll thirst again. But if you drink from me, the river of living water, if you partake of me, you will never thirst. So I believe we need to be continually filled with the presence of God. One of the things that I personally like to do is just maintain um, what I call a constant state of prayer. And that is where you're just constantly praying to God. Now, not every single second of the day are you, you know, just totally 100% praying to God. But throughout the day, it's just like God is a constant companion with you and you're visiting with him. Remember, one of the things that I like to think about is when Adam, before the, before the fall of man, before Eve took the apple, gave it to Adam, and they both ate, God walked with Adam in the garden as a friend walked with a friend. I believe Jesus Christ came and died, gave his life for us to restore that relationship. God is our Savior and God. There is one God. We are to worship him. We are to reverence him. We are to, he is holy. But I believe God wants to have a friendship with us. He wants to be approachable by us. He wants us to come to him in times of trouble. God walked with Adam in the garden as a friend walked with a friend. That is not saying that we need to, we still need to reverence God. We still need to realize we need a Savior, that Jesus Christ is our Savior by him, his death on the cross and resurrection. Our sins are forgiven. By his stripes we are healed. We still hold him up as the Savior of the world and our personal Savior. But I also believe that God wants to walk with us and restore that relationship. So as we're in this constant state of prayer, um, one of the things that I've told a lot of friends is I like to walk through life just like a lion is walking beside of me, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Now just imagine if you have a pet lion that's friendly to you, but if the enemy comes toward you, the lion turns him in and growls. The enemy isn't going to come near you. You are walking through life just like you have the lion of the tribe of Judah walking beside you. Because in, in essence you do. If you have the Holy Spirit inside of you, you have the presence of God in your life. You have the presence of God in your life. As you continually fill yourself with the Holy Spirit, out of you will pour rivers of living water. If you feel like your Christian life is stagnant, there's nothing going on, uh, you feel like your prayers are being answered, you feel God is distant, I would, I would encourage you to read your word and open your heart to God and say, God, I don't want to feel distant from you. I want to walk with you just like Adam did as a friend walked with a friend. I want the lion of the tribe of Judah to walk beside me. I want to have this presence of God in my life so that when I walk when a friend comes up to me that's having health issues, when I run into a situation in the supermarket, that, that God is with me and that I know that and then I can walk into a situation and bring the peace of God into it. 
You know, one of the things that police officers and firefighters, especially police officers, have told me is that one of the reasons they like to be a police officer is they can come into a situation and they can restore order where there's chaos. There's um, a servant heart inside of them that they want to come in and, and restore order and serve mankind by restoring order where there's chaos. And that's something that, that they, many police officers, deputies, Oregon State police troopers, that's what motivates them. And that's one of the personal satisfactions they get out of the job. That should be the same thing that we do as Christians. As we come into a situation, we should bring the peace of God into it. Because we are carriers. We should be carriers of the Holy Spirit of God. Remember, and I've constantly referred to this analogy, I think right now it is very appropriate, when the disciples were in the boat with Jesus Christ and he was sleeping in the storm. Because the peace of God that was in him was stronger than the storm that was raging outside. There are so many storms of life, the economy, every day we were, watch, were watching the news and the world strife, uh, the Iraq war, Afghanistan war, the economy, jobs, so many people losing their homes. Um, I had a, a person tell me yesterday or this weekend that some economists are saying we are in a depression. Uh, that's not widely reported. I'm not going to make a political statement or an economic statement because I am not an economist, but we are in a serious recession, a recession that we have not seen since the Great Depression. And some economists are now saying that we are in a depression. I don't want that to, to scare you. Again, let's go back to the story of Jesus in the boat sleeping during the storm. So many storms of life today. I saw a commercial on TV last night where they're starting to advertise books talking about the end of the earth, uh, Revelation. People are hungry to talk about Revelation and end times. In fact, we have a class here Friday nights at 7, taught by Dr. Tom Watson, where he speaks about Revelation and end times. It's one of our more popular uploads on our YouTube account at uh, tjn1.tv and evm1.info. So there's just a lot of trials, a lot of problems, a lot of challenges in our life today. Back to the storm analogy. Jesus was asleep. One of the things I love about the Bible is the stories in the Bible. There's so many, so many different truths and so many different ways, depending on what you're walking through in your life, that these stories can apply differently to you in different circumstances. So, who are we in the story of the storm? Are we Jesus sleeping in the boat? or at least have the, the peace of Jesus. Hopefully we're not the storm. <laughs> um, or are we the disciples that are just frantic and saying, Jesus, don't you care that we're going to die? Don't you know that the storm could kill us? <coughs> so when Jesus wakes up, he rebukes them for their lack of faith and says, oh, you have little faith. And Jesus turns and speaks to the storm. And immediately the waters quieted. And the disciples said, Who is this man that even the winds and the waves obey him? Because the peace of God, the power of God, was stronger than the storm around him. And so it allowed him to sleep in that storm and have quiet in the storm. And then when we woke up, he, did, he demonstrated that physically by speaking to the storm and the storm quieted. That is the peace of God that we need these days, the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. So, I guess three, point, three main points this morning. Number one, that like the church in Corinth, Paul was concerned about divisions in the body of Christ. Paul, I would think, would be concerned about what he's seeing today with denominations and divisions and this... this um, some people call it empire building, but church and denomination building uh, to the exclusion of the body of Christ. I have heard some complaints in overseas countries that some denominations and some churches that come over there are more concerned about building their denomination than building the body of Christ. One instance in particular where a tribe asked missionaries to leave because they were causing dissension in the tribe 
because they were more concerned that the tribe's people follow their denomination than another denomination. That is a terrible testimony and witness to Jesus Christ. And I believe people will have to answer for that when they face God. Read the Bible. A lot of lessons we can learn about what's happening today, even though this happened thousands of years ago, over 2,000 years ago. In some ways, we don't learn from history. We don't learn. Read the book of Corinthians, first, second. Read the prologue about you know what was going on, why Paul wrote it, what were his concerns, and I think you'll find a lot of similarities today. So, unity in the body of Christ, very, very important today. The power, point two is the power and presence of the Holy Spirit of God. As we read in Acts 19, Paul is saying that they need to be baptized and that the Holy Spirit needs to enter their life. Remember, Jesus Christ himself told the apostles, the, the apostles that they need the Holy Spirit. Do not go, do not leave home without it. Do not leave home without it. Don't go and don't leave your home without the Holy Spirit. Amen. Don't leave home without it. Jesus said, don't leave Jerusalem until the Comforter comes. There, I will go to my Father. Unless I go to my Father, I can't send the Comforter. You need this to empower you in your life. And after the second chapter of Acts, you saw issues where Peter would walk by people and people would line the streets just so the shadow of Peter would fall over them and they would be healed. I think that's a beautiful analogy of the presence of God. When, when Peter was just in the room, Peter didn't even have to touch him. All that had to happen was the shadow of Peter would fall over them. And the presence of God was so strong in Peter, the Holy Spirit of God was so strong in Peter that they were healed. They could see the power of God. Can the world see the power of God today in the church? Let me ask that question again. Can the world see the power of God displayed in the church today? If not, why is that? In the Bible, it says unity commands a blessing. In the Bible, it says wherever, whenever possible, be it unity one with another. Now, there will be times we disagree. There were times in the Bible when there was disagreements. But the core belief, the core foundational uh, scripture, theology that we need to have is Jesus Christ is the Son of God, died for our sins, rose on the third day. By his stripes, we are healed. Through him is eternal life. He is the only way to heaven. There are some churches that are teaching today that Jesus Christ is one way to heaven. I don't believe that's the, tra that's the case. Jesus Christ says, I am the way. No man goes to the Father except through me. So as we, we need to be unified in core theology. Instead of getting sidetracked on all these issues about when does the Holy Spirit enter a believer? Do they need the second baptism? We instead, need, instead of doing that, we need to look for the evidence of the Holy Spirit in their lives. Just a personal, pref just a personal observation. But I've noticed the Holy Spirit enter believers upon their initial uh, acceptance of Jesus Christ. I've seen the fruit of the Spirit in their lives after that time. I've seen other believers that needed the second infilling. But more importantly than that, I think we need to be continually infilled with the power of the Holy Spirit. There is a time in your life when you, st you do need to ask Jesus Christ, for, and we'll give you a chance to do that at the end of the service, you need to ask Jesus Christ to come into your life and be your Savior and acknowledge Him as King and Lord of your life. And I think it's also important that you ask for the power of the Holy Spirit to come into your life. If that is not the case, why does the Bible say, do not grieve the Holy Spirit? Why does the Bible say the only sin that will not be forgiven is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit? If the Holy Spirit isn't instrumental in the love in the life and empowerment of the believer, why does it say that in this book? 
I challenge you to read that and pray about it. The Holy Spirit is instrumental. Also, it says in the Bible, the Holy Spirit will not bring um, glory to himself, but will honor the Son of God. But the Holy Spirit will equip you, will comfort you, will empower you, will be that presence, that peace in the storm. And as Peter was walking by and the shadow was falling over people, it was the Holy Spirit empowering Peter that allowed that to happen. The presence of God was so strong in Peter that his cup runneth over. You hear a uh, description in the Bible that, that we need to be filled to overflowing with the Holy Spirit. Our cup needs to be filled with the Holy Spirit to overflowing. A beautiful analogy of the river, pour, river of life pouring out of us. That river comes from the rock that is Jesus Christ. But it is a river. It is not a pool or a lake. In other words, we don't kind of, okay, th I'm, I'm cool here. I've got the Holy Spirit. I'm kind of, I'm content. I'm camped out here. I've paid my fire insurance. I'm going to heaven and, and I'm just fat, dumb and happy here. And sorry, that's a, a term here in the United States. In other words, I'm content and I've got all I need. And I've got my own little world here. I've got my own little Christianity thing going on. I go to church on Sunday. Um, when I drive past a homeless person in the street, I'm not too concerned. Somebody will take care of them. It's not what the Bible says. We need to be filled with overflowing. We need to be filled with love and compassion for the lost and the hurting. Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations. We're going to be going to New Zealand November 1st. going to be there for two weeks. Why are we doing that? Because Jesus Christ said, go and make disciples of all nations. Go and make, go. Go, 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 go. Go and make disciples of all nations. He did not say, stay and build a church and they'll come. He did not say that. He said, go and make disciples of all nations. So when we drive past this homeless guy in the street, we need to have mercy and compassion when Jesus was standing over Jerusalem, he wept over the city. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that murders the prophets, that stone those who were sent to her. How I long to gather you under my wings as a hen gathers her chicks. So, Jerusalem, the city that murders the prophets and stones those who were sent to her. Still, with that situation, Jesus said, I long to gather you under my wings. That's God. That's not our flesh. If the Son of God says, the city is doing these terrible things to the people I'm sending to them to preach the good news, but I still long to gather them under my wings, like a mother hen gathers her chicks. That is the image of Jesus Christ. That is the image of God. That is the love of God that needs to pour from us. We need to move, be moved by compassion uh, for the lost and the hurting and the dying. One of the things that, uh, one of my personal motivations that really um, equips me, encourages me, empowers me to go day after day after day after day after day is knowing that somebody died last night in Bend, Oregon that didn't know Jesus Christ because we didn't get to her or we didn't get to him. We need to be passionate about evangelism. And you don't have to stand out in the street corner and hand out tracts to be an evangelist. One way you can do it is what's called lifestyle evangelism, which is you be Jesus. You have the peace of God in you that is overflowing and when people come to you and say, you know what? You always seem to be so happy. You always seem to be so, no matter what's going on, always seem to be so at peace. You seem to be happy. And we know it's actually joy, but to them, they use the word happy. Some, things don't seem to bother you as much as it bothers other people. What is it about you? That is evangelism. Because people can see the presence of Christ in your life. They can see this fruit of the Holy Spirit. Joy, peace, gentleness, long-suffering, love, against which there is no law because there doesn't need to be. It should be our motivation, our passion to love one another. 
Jesus Christ said, the world will know you're my disciples by the love you share one for another. The world will know that you're my disciples by the love that you show one for another. That's how they'll know. The love of Christ exampled through you. So, if you're not comfortable standing on a street corner handing out tracts, just be Jesus. Be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. How you do that one way is you just be peaceful in unpeaceful situations. You bring the peace of God into situations that are not peaceful, such as losing your job, going into a situation where... Um, there's, there's host, hostility, conflict. Just like that analogy of the police officer. They like to go in and they like to restore order in times of chaos. As Christians, we can do that today. We can come into a situation and bring the peace of God. We can be like the shadow of Peter that passed over the sick and heals them. But in our situation, we can simply bring the peace of God into a situation and have that river of life flowing through us, we can be carriers of the presence. The Holy Spirit can and will and wants to live inside of you. The disciples asked Jesus, when will the kingdom of God come? And Jesus said, the kingdom of God is here within you with the empowerment, with the presence of the Holy Spirit of God, who is here and exists to give glory to the Son, all glory to Jesus Christ. But you need that empowerment of the Holy Spirit. If you're constantly struggling with fear, with addictions, uh, be it drugs or sex or gambling or anything else, worry, ask Jesus Christ into your life. Ask for the presence of the Holy Spirit. Ask for the presence of God. The Trinity is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In the beginning was God. There's reference to we formed man in our own image. We, a triune God. That's still a mystery to us how God can be three persons, but He is. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. In the beginning was God. In the beginning is God. God is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And we don't, in our human understanding, can't comprehend that. In the beginning was God. He always was and always will be. The creator of the heavens and the universe and this planet. You can trust him. I would encourage you to read the book of John. If you're a new believer, read the book of John. If you are an existing believer, I would read the book of Ephesians and the book of Corinthians, first and second. And and look about one thing that God really touched in my heart was the divisions in the body. And and John's instruction to the church about divisions and picking sides Um, we really need to get over that and we really need to we really need to um, join one another in the body of Christ one of the things that we're going to be doing here is uh, we're going to be reading announcements of other churches on our Sunday service um, our Sunday service is designed to be broadcast on the internet. If you're going to another church and you're happy there and you're being fed there, please continue to go. If you want to hear what we're teaching, you can go online afterwards and, and see what God's putting on our heart. If you're not currently in fellowship somewhere and looking for a church, we have uh, some empty seats here that we would be glad for you to come in and, and join us on Sunday morning. We have a number of teachings. We're adding more online. Uh, for example, there is uh, an end times of prophecy teaching on Friday night at 7 with Dr. Tom Watson. I do want to share with you a word about Halloween. Uh, we mentioned this church, a Christian Life Center in Bend, 6 p.m. on Monday the 31st. 
uh, we'll have a family fun circus. And please take your kids there and have a lot of fun. Family fun games, uh, candy, and uh, kids love candy on Halloween. I hate Halloween. Uh, Halloween is a, is, a, is a holiday that glorifies Satan. Uh, I'm tired of it. I'm sick of it. I love it when churches do uh, things like the Harvest Festival. What we're going to be doing here on uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday nights is praying. Also Monday night. Monday night we typically have healing rooms here at Ephesian Vision Ministries from 7 to 9 p.m. We will have healing rooms here on Monday night, Halloween night. So while the trick-or-treaters and the spooks and the ghosts and the goblins are out running around, we're going to be filling this building with the presence of the Holy Spirit and with God, worshiping Him and praying for healing. If you need healing, come on Halloween night and get healed and set free. You don't have to live in fear of the ghosts or goblins. Um, but God's put it on my heart. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday night, in Bend, there's going to be a tour of some haunted houses, haunted buildings where they believe the spirits are still there. While those tours are going on, we're going to be here praying in this building. Uh, we're going to be interceding in prayer, and I'm encouraging other churches to either have harvest festivals, have a small group together to pray and intercede for the city. Do it in your home, do it in your church, do it wherever, but do it. Uh, if you feel that you want to join with other believers, uh, you can come here to Ephesian Vision Ministries, 711 Northeast Butler Market Road, and join us. There might be a very small group of us here praying on, on those nights. But while everybody's out looking for Casper, we're going to be praying to the Holy Spirit. Uh, it's just something God's put on my heart to do. Uh, and the... The call that I have on my life to do it this year is stronger than ever before. And I think a lot of it is because there's so much fear in the land because of all the situations going on. So we are going to give you right now a chance to receive Jesus Christ. If you are overcome with addictions, if you constantly stumble in your life, actually we're going to have two prayers. We're going to pray for you to accept Jesus Christ for the first time. If you have already accepted Jesus Christ and there's issues in your life that um, you're having trouble with, continual stump, continued addictions, continued whatever, fear, we'll pray a second prayer for you to be continually filled and for the Holy Spirit to be manifest in your life. If you're an existing Christian and you're having trouble connecting with God, hearing from God, thinking your prayers are not being answered. So right now, if you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, right now I'm going to ask you to repeat this prayer after me and accept Him as your Savior. Say, Lord, I accept Jesus Christ as my Savior. I want to walk with Him as a friend walks with a friend in the garden. I know that he died for my sins on Calvary. I know that he died for my sins on Calvary. And I ask him to forgive my sins. And I ask him to forgive my sins. He paid the penalty that I do not have to. He paid the penalty that I do not have to. Send me your Holy Spirit. Send me your Holy Spirit. Live inside of me. Give me the strength to follow you. Give me the strength to follow you. Let your spirit be like a river in me. Let your spirit be like a river in me. So others can see Jesus in me. So others can see Jesus in me. Help me, God, follow your law. Help me, God, follow your law. Of peace. Of peace. Love. Love. Gentleness. And long, suffering. and long suffering. Let me know the joy of the Lord. As I follow you this day. Amen. Amen. If you are not a Christian, you are now one. And you belong to the family of God. And uh, there's some exciting stuff in store for you. If you are an existing believer and you have constantly struggled with sin, with worry, with fear, um, 
you just feel connected from God. You feel that when you go into church and the cross is, is on the building, it's like the cross is so far away. And uh, in the days of the Bible, people would reach out and touch the garment of Jesus to be healed. And you feel like that garment is just so far away. And God is so far removed from you and you've done things in your life that there's no way God can forgive you. That is a lie of the enemy. And that is not what Jesus Christ said. Jesus Christ said, Come unto me, all who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest for your souls. That's what Jesus said. So if that's your situation, or a similar situation where, man, you've accepted Jesus, but you've either backslidden or it just doesn't seem to be working for you, then pray this prayer. Jesus, I have accepted you as my Savior. But I want a closer relationship with you. Walk with me as a friend. But first you're my Savior and Lord. I want to know you. Personally and intimately. And very closely. Fill me with your Holy Spirit right now. Give me the strength to overcome my addictions. Give me the strength to overcome my fear. Live inside of me like that river of living water. Let me flow onto others with your Spirit. Continually infill me with your Holy Spirit. Let my walk with you be a relationship and not a religion. Thank you, Jesus Christ, for your Holy Spirit. Amen. Continue to be in the Word of God. Continue to ask God to empower you in your life, and He will do so. There is so many things to be afraid of, but Jesus Christ said, and so many people say 365 times in the Bible. There's some controversy about the numbers, but time and time and time and time and time again in the Bible, it says, do not be afraid. Do not fear, for I am with you even into the end of the world. I will never leave you or forsake you. I will be there. There are some people watching today that they've been betrayed by a friend, that they've been betrayed, that the trust has been broken. And, and they are having a hard time understanding this concept of God always being there for them because in their life maybe it's a spouse there's some people watching today that that they've been um, betrayed by the trust of a spouse it, 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 there was a bit, huge betrayal there and they don't feel like they can trust anyone you can trust God Jesus Christ said I will never never leave you or forsake you I will be there he is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. In the beginning was God. And this God that was in the beginning will never end. As you become a Christian, if you're not already one, hopefully you are, and hopefully you repeated that prayer, but you have an eternal destiny with Jesus Christ. Your spirit, your spirit man, inside of us there is a spirit. We are a flesh, but we're also a spirit. That spirit is regenerated, is born again. It talks in the Bible about a born again experience. Jesus told Nicodemus, unless a man is born again, uh, flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. A beautiful analogy of that, when the Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary and she conceived Jesus Christ. The Spirit came upon her. 
There's a beautiful analogy there about the, the, the Spirit coming on a believer and giving them new life. Jesus said, you must be born of the Spirit or born again. I pray that that phrase gets new meaning in your life today. If you need to email me, please do so. Um, we accept your, your if, if you're not ex- attending or, or uh, belonging to another church, we accept your tithes and offerings. We accept your tithe if you're not currently tithing to another church. But irregardless, we accept your offerings if you are attending another church. But please continue to give to them because that's your home church. Uh, We do need your support prayerfully, financially, as we uh, roll out ministry here in this time of of, uh, challenging economy. But we're trusting in God. We are trusting in God, as you do need to do so as well. Uh, our website's www.tjn1.tv. That's the Jesus Network, the number one dot TV, or evm1.info. www.e like Ephesians, v like vision, b like ministries, the number one dot info. Be blessed this day. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. For I am with you even unto the end of the world. Be blessed this day. God be with you. Again, my email address, I was going to say that, I forgot. My email address is dave at evm1.info. Dave at evm, the number one, dot info, I-N-F-O. Be blessed this day and go with God. Amen.